So good to be with you. How are you this morning? Awesome. You doing okay? There is a, a vibe in this room. Uh, it's been 20 years since I've been at Parkwood, actually. I, I was saying to Pastor Gary that I was doing Bible college courses in one of the rooms over here back in 2004. And so great to be back. Uh, I don't know how much psychoanalyzing we're going to do. That's a bit of pressure. <laughs> Um, but really just thrilled to be here. I was saying to Pastor Gary this morning uh, in the back room, um, uh, there's a bit of pressure here because I tuned in last week, uh, or I tuned in this week and kind of to your gathering from last week, and there's a lot going on. Uh, you know, all this transition and outreach and all these things happening, and you have an Australian coming. <laughs> Too easy, mate, right? I just want to encourage you to go up to her and just say, let's throw a shrimp on the barbie. You want to do that? That'd be good. Um, and so I just feel like hopefully today isn't just a big letdown after all the exciting news. I'm like, it can probably only go down from there. So here I am. But it's uh, really great to be with you. And <laughs> we do have a bit to pack in this morning. So we're going to get right to it. Is that okay? Is that all right? If you have a Bible and you want to open with me, you can open up with me to Genesis chapter 3. That's where we're going to be. And I'm going to fire up my 2011 MacBook Air and just pray to God. It turns on. And it did. So we're good. Um, you know, the Hebrew creation account is magnificent. The early pages of Genesis we see there is just God creating everywhere, right? And there's rhythm, there's a cadence to it. Actually, if you were to read in the original language, one of the things you would feel if you were to read in Hebrew, you'd almost feel it in your gut. Day after day, God is creating, and it is, it's good. And there's intention there, actually, in the poem. You're supposed to feel it. Day one, God creates, and it is good. And God creates, and it is good. And God creates, and it is good. And you're feeling it over and over. Till the very end of his creation, you see it is tov tov. It is very good. God's creation is good. So one of the things we get actually a picture of in the poem and as it kind of unfolds is everything is in rhythm. One of the words that would be used is shalom. It's not just a peace that's kind of absence of war. It is complete beauty and rest, cohesion, fusion. God is in relationship with humans and the earth. It's all good. I heard one person say, there was sex without lust. There was food without gluttony. There was wine without alcoholism. Imagine this place, right? The Hebrew writer gives us a vision that they were, in, in their own words, naked and unashamed right? They're literally running around naked. This is the place. No shame at all. And if you read this story, how long does it last? Not very long, right? Maybe two pages for some of you in the scriptures. Maybe for some of you a little less. And everything kind of unravels. Proto-human in the garden is given one command outside in, in this garden, God said to them, you must not eat from the, uh, from the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. In the garden, we actually see that there's this job description. Proto-human is given uh, a job description to flourish, to take the creation project and to actually move it forward, to take the raw materials of the garden and to create. Yet in the story, we see that there's this tempter, the Satan comes and tempts proto-human. I, I always find it fascinating when I come back to this story and read it. It's interesting that the Satan didn't use like bullets and bombs and violence, right? What do you use? Words. Ideas. Lies. Ultimately, the, the lie in the garden that the, the Satan kind of hands over to humans is that you can be like me. You can be your own God. And so proto-human enters into this temptation, and everything unravels at the core. Now you're like, who invited this guy, right? The mental health guy, and like, you're, this sounds pretty depressing. Um, I think this piece of the story fits and frames our work for today and what we want to talk about around mental and emotional health. 
Interesting in the story that actually God hands down curses to the Satan, to the man and to the woman. If you want to read with me in verse 16, it says this, to the woman he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to your children. And brothers and sisters, I have been there four times. <laughs> epidural, epidural, right? I remember our first, our daughter's 14. I remember uh, sitting, once the epidural came, it was like watching baseball. It was just so beautiful. I'm sure my wife would have other, other story there. But there's pain, so childbirth is beautiful and it's gnarly all in the same time. Your, your desire, God says, will be for your husband and he will rule over you. So there's a picture that the garden is ideal, but now through this brokenness that there's a sense of chauvinism, he will rule over you. To Adam, he said, curses the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you're, you return to the ground. Since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. So there's a picture of here of work, which was actually beautiful in the garden. There was like a mandate for humans to create. Now there's blood and sweat and tears, and ultimately human will go back into the ground in death. Who brought the depressing guy along to speak at Parkwood on a Sunday morning, right? But this is the story. Uh, one fringe 20th century thinker and uh, a philosopher, his name was C.S. Lewis, he talks and gives the picture that as everything unravels, the picture should we get in our, that we should get in our minds and our hearts is that everything is bent and broken. It's turned on its head, right? And I know you feel this in this room, right? Like all we have to do is ask the question as we look around, even at the cultural landscape, how's it going for us? Dirty politics, brokenness all around us. I put it like this, uh, I've been saying a lot in our own community, rebellion in the garden leads to pain in our relationships, broken and abused sexuality, frustrated, unsatisfied work, and the fall of our mind and emotions. And so there's brokenness and shame. There's abuse. There's country music, right? <laughs> okay, maybe not that part, but. But in all seriousness, we kind of have to paint a picture of this even with our own mind and our own emotions that Everything through the fall is bent, and now we live in this moment where there are, and you know this, I don't have to, we know this now, especially through COVID, that there are tremendous mental health, mental and emotional health issues. And this is part of us. It's part of our very being. You know, and we all have our own story of this in this room. Some of you, I know you're probably sitting even as we talk about this, and you feel it. You feel your own story. For me, it was December 20th, 2015. Uh, it was actually Christmas Sunday, and on that day, a really good friend of mine invited me to go to the Detroit Red Wings game that Sunday evening. It was after our Christmas services, and he said, why don't you come along? And I said, well, I'm a Leafs fan. Amen. It was easy to wake up this morning, let me just say that. <laughs> Um, and I know some of you, just being so close to Detroit, are Red Wings fans, which is, that's okay, that's all right. It, it, it's easier to be a Detroit Red Wings fan than a Windsor Spitfires fan, am I right? Oh, the guy up the road came from London. Just gonna say, just gonna say. How did uh, Shane Wright work out there? So that's another, another story. But. So he invited me to this game, and uh, we're sitting, enjoying our time. He got up to go to the concession, and we were kind of squeezed in the middle row, and so he went to the outside. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I felt this panic and anxiety come over my body like I had never felt. I started sweating through my coat. My heart was racing, and he had actually got up to the end of the aisle and was about to go down the stairs to get us some food. And he looked at me and basically looked me in the eyes, and as I was trying to get his attention, saying something was happening, happening, he thought I was actually wanting food and drink, so he was kind of looking at me, trying to take my order, and I said to him, I literally yelled, you need to stay there, you cannot leave. He kind of looked at me funny, and I 
I got myself up into the end of the aisle, and for 40 minutes, I walked the 300 levels of the concourse at Joe Louis Arena, trying to get myself under control, sweating, heart, heart racing, all sorts of things going on in my mind and emotions. And honestly, out of nowhere, out of nowhere, um, I remember that night sitting on the steps, and many of you know the old Joe, Joe Louis Arena, sitting on the steps and just wondering, what is going on? What is, what is going on? No childhood trauma, really. I mean, I did grow up in a pastor's home, and that's another sermon for another day. But honestly, all joking aside, really no trauma in my own story, in my own kind of experiences. And from there, it was months of, out of nowhere, panic and anxiety taking over. I'd pray, I'd read my, read my Bible. Um, even worse is it would come on at times when I was preaching and teaching at times, which was terrible. I mean, this, I love this. For eight years up to that point, I was preaching and teaching every week, and I just, I love this. I love this environment and opportunity. And every once in a while, a rush of panic would come as I would be teaching. And even maybe this morning at some point, I know how to manage it a bit, but would come over. And it was almost like it was, and I don't mean, mean to make light of this, it was almost like it was this thorn in the flesh type of thing, right? Now, we don't know for Paul, the Apostle Paul, what that was. Theologians are kind of divided on that. But it was kind of this thing that came out of nowhere and began to affect my life. And I know for many of us in this room, maybe we've had these types of experiences and have had to learn how to manage this as part of our bodies and our own even spiritual experience. And so this has shaped my life and, and over the years now has kind of pushed me and invited me in. I was at that point in my life on a trajectory actually to do a, a PhD in theology. I was finishing my master's and thought a PhD was the way to go. I thought I'd be teaching in institutions around theology and continuing to lead in our church. But over the last little while, have really engaged in counseling psychology and rubbed shoulders with some beautiful people in psychotherapy and now are practicing, uh, primarily helping with men's issues. I have a wide variety of people I work with, but we've seen over the last little while the importance of providing good care for men because this is something that has been so void. And so this is a big part of my story, and uh, I think this will help, again, shape some of the things we want to talk about this morning and help kind of bridge, because for me, there's been a real bridge recently in bridging the church and mental health issues, helping in that, kind of being in both worlds, bridging theology and bridging psychology together. And a lot of it has to do with managing pain, right? That it's kind of inevitable. Are you with me? In this, as we've created and laid the foundation, this is part of our story. In 2008, I ran my first marathon. Thank you, thank you, yes, thanks. So, I, I, don't, know, I don't know why I tried to elicit that. That was weird, I'm sorry. But, um, and I was a, a punk 24-year-old kid, and in my 24-year-old brain, I thought because I ran, you know, I ran pretty much every day, four or five times a week, about seven or eight kilometers, I thought, you know what, I can run a marathon. And in my brain, I had thought, you know, basically it's like four runs put together. That's really all it is. And so I showed up on the day of the run in my basketball sh sh shorts, my beat up sneakers, and a cut off t-shirt. And that was like back in 2007 where there was not 2008 where it wasn't, wasn't like a dry fit t-shirt, it was like a t-shirt. I did nothing that they tell you to do in preparing for a marathon, like having the right footwear, this may be too much information, but putting Vaseline in certain places, preparing your body, drinking water, eating properly, and running more than 10 kilometers at a time. And so I began this race, and as I started running, guys, I gotta tell you, the first 10 kilometers, I was crushing it. I was, I was running by people with ease and you know, kind of judging them as I ran by, right, as you do. And um, things were going very, very well. Until about the 15 kilometer mark, when I realized uh, this, is, this compounds. This isn't four like runs in a row. This, as time goes, as kilometers go, this, this compounds. 
And so as I was running back through in London, the race runs, and what happens, you start the first half and you run to the north end of the city and back to where it started because people stopped because they were smart enough to choose the half marathon option, so you actually end with them. And I remember running through and running through this, this end line and realizing I have to do this all over again. And as I'm running, I can feel my body compounding, my, my legs seizing up. I can feel the areas on my body that were supposed to be prepared for, you know, with the, the preparation of eating and just like stretching and all the things that I didn't do. I got to the park and, and eventually as I'm running, I'm breaking down and I'm beginning to walk and my ego, my 24-year-old ego is being crushed because there are, are literally people my parents and grandparents age running by me. And so, suffice to say, I did not finish at my goal. I ended up finishing and walking across the finish line much uh, longer than what I had anticipated. And there was a lady in line who was legit, close to my grandmother's age, who came up to me and we began to talk. And she said to me, hey, is this your first marathon? And I said, yes, it is. How was it? Oh, it was wonderful. <laughs> and uh, she said to me, um, this is like my 30th marathon. And she said to me something that will never leave me, ever leave me. She said, there will be pain. It all comes down to how you manage it. There will be pain. It all comes down to how you manage it. And in light of the reality of the moment we're in, where we live between the times, right? We live between the garden, which was good and flourishing, and the age to come, which is coming, we don't know when, but when Jesus unites heaven and earth and brings heaven and earth back together, we live between the times, and part of it is learning how to manage our pain. So for the next few minutes, just what I want to do is just talk about our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. Take a minute to talk about trauma and attachment. Now, I imagine in a room this size, when you hear this, you may feel it in your body a bit because you want to think, and this is good, this is actually a good tension, you want to think, wait a second, like, is this biblical, right? The tension for some of us around some of these things, and I get it, is what does the Bible have to say, and, and how does the Bible inform these things? And I just got on the, the 401 to come down here just to remind us and help us that these things don't have to be scary. These things don't have to be scary. They may not be directly informed by the Bible, but I, over the last little while, have realized and seen that many of the techniques and many of the things that we have available to us are beautiful, and they are a gift from God. They really are. And they can help us. So the Bible may not directly speak to them, but there's something that can help us in our own mental and emotional health. Just like I was thinking this week, you know, when I was 12 years old, in 1995, on New Year's Eve day, when I went to my hockey coach's house, because he invited our team over to skate on his backyard rink, and he skated over my finger. Yeah, welcome to church, so glad you're here. When he did that, interestingly enough, I did not flip to like scripture in verse, right? In that moment, I wasn't flipping through my Bible thinking, you know, I wonder how this is really going to help me. Now, I love the Bible. You already heard, theology guy. I love the scriptures, teach the scriptures every week. But in that moment, I needed a doctor. And I actually have core memories as a 12-year-old, that whole experience. I call it the broken arm effect. In this room, if you broke your arm, what would you do? you would probably go and, would we pray for you? Absolutely. Do we b believe in the power of prayer? I think in a church, I, I'm sensing the vibe that there's a sense of like, you believe in healing here? Do you believe? Okay, I kind of, kind of sense that this morning as we sing and celebrate. There's a pulse here. But at the same time, most of us in this room, though I believe in that too, I, I believe in healing, most of us would go and we would get our arm set and put in a cast unless you're my wife, who when she was 17 broke her arm snowboarding, and set the they set the cast, but they set it wrong, and so she would take it on and off and like put it on the kitchen counter, so much so that her arm is like bent, kind of funny because they set it wrong, and now anytime there is a thunderstorm coming, she feels it in her arm, so we call her the Doppler radar. 
But that is beyond the, that's probably taking away from the illustration. The illustration is this. We go, if you have health issues, and we use doctors, and we use them as a gift from God. And as we bridge mental health issues with the church, sometimes we just need to be, we need to be made aware that there are things that are available to us that are beautiful and true and good and can help us. Specifically, there's been a lot of research the last few decades, three or four decades, that have gone into the interconnection of our thoughts, our feelings, and our behaviors. I think we have a little picture here that we can throw up, just the interconnection, just a little visual to get us to see and help us see these. The reality is, is that when we separate these things and work with these things in our lives, there is tremendous influence that each one has over each other. And there's been a lot of research that's shown if we actually want to change one of these things, we can focus on the other to influence. Does that make sense? Hang in. I don't want to get too, like, schooly here. Are you with me, Parkwood? Is it okay? And so sometimes we very much as people dial into how we're feeling, but a lot of the times what we need to do is we need to work with either our thoughts or our behavior patterns to help how we feel over time. For example, our thoughts, our thoughts are very much like highways, right? Even in our brains, our thoughts, the way in which they're going are like highways. And there's been a lot of research that has shown recently that by default, we as humans tend to think negatively, right? we're often controlled, even, even for those of us that are followers of Jesus, tend to struggle and deal with negative thoughts. The, the age-old thing I often say is, you do something, and you do something maybe fairly well, nine people praise you, one person is critical of you, what do you think you think about? For most of us in this room, it's that one thing. Try being a pastor, <laughs> right? I know Danny, Pastor Danny's watching in his PJs this morning because he isn't feeling great. So he, know, he knows about this, right? And it's, it's not that criticism is necessarily bad. It's just that we're often controlled by our negative thoughts. And so the, the amazing thing is, is that we can actually disrupt these highways, these pathways, by identifying some of the patterns we have in our own thinking and reframing with true and accurate thoughts. It's beautiful that there's actually ways in which we can slow down in our lives with, with the thoughts that kind of control us. And almost like a domino effect where they affect how we feel, we can dial into them and think clearly. And, 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 and I actually think more, think more truthfully, identifying and reframing. Now, some of you are like, again, whoa, 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 where's the Bible? Where's the Bible in this? Do you know what the Bible says about our thoughts? Throw it up, boys, or whoever's back there girls, whoever's back there. Romans 12, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Or Philippians 4, you often maybe hear this at weddings, I've heard this. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is uh, noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. What's Paul saying? There is power, and secular research would show this, that there is power in how we think. And we have the ability to disrupt kind of the negative, at times, pathways in our thinking. Colossians 3 says this, set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. Paul understood in the context of the first century with these little itty-bitty churches that are being planted that he wants these communities to think about what is true and what is right. And so this isn't just to, to broad brush everything and say, well, how you're feeling doesn't matter. Absolutely not. But what we do say is we move towards our feelings, and in the process, oftentimes, our feelings are deeply connected to how we think. And brothers and sisters, as Jesus followers... We have the gold. Are you with me? You and I are created in the image of God. Think about that and what that shapes and how it shapes our story. Think about the story of God that we're leaning into this morning. It starts in a garden that's good. It's very good. 
Yes, we live in this moment of brokenness, but there is this movement towards the renewal of heaven and earth. We can set our mind on those things, and I actually believe those things change how we feel in deep and profound ways. I also think our habits and patterns in our behavior and actions can actually change how we think and feel as well. You know what's fascinating? Is if you read the Sermon on the Mount, which is in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, it's a string of Jesus' teachings together, like his most formative teachings. It's a beautiful set of teachings. And at the end of those teachings, Jesus actually tells a parable. And he tells a parable of two people. What's interesting about this parable is that both people in the parable have heard what Jesus has just taught. Jesus actually says that both of these people have heard these words of mine, which means you have two people who have heard exactly the same thing. And yet Jesus says one, one of these people has built their life on the sand, right, where the rains come and the winds mess things up, but the other person has built their life on the rock. You have two people heard exactly the same thing, two different outcomes. So what influences the outcome? Um, it's this Greek word, poieo. Do you want to say that with me? Can we say that all together? Poieo? See, you're all Greek scholars. You can just go home and razzle-dazzle somebody at lunch. It'll be good. This word poieo is used by Jesus as the indicator of hearing the teaching, but it is the indicator of the transformation. And you know what this word means in English? To practice or to bear. Actually, in Matthew 7 alone, this word poieo is translated different times in your Bibles, but the same Greek word is used over and over, I think 27 times um, throughout the, the, the scripture, or sorry, seven times throughout the scriptures here in 29 verses, my apologies. Seven times in 29 verses, Paul uses this word because it indicates for us that it is about practice. It is about habits. You think about it, Jesus, the greatest teacher to ever walk the face of the earth, knew that his teachings on their own would not bring transformation. And how do we know this? Because two people hear exactly the same thing. One puts it into practice. The other doesn't. One builds their life on the rock. The other gets swept away in the sand. So I know as Protestants, we kind of feel like, oh my goodness, like it's about being saved by faith through grace. Absolutely. But it's interesting, every time Paul talks about being saved by faith through grace, he talks about good works. The early Christians were habitual people. There were practices within their own behaviors that led them in the way of Jesus. And this is essential to even changing how we think and how we feel. I know you had Dr. Grant Mullen here in the fall, and I was actually scrolling through your Instagram feed and saw, and he said this, you, you can know everything about emotional health and how to unload your baggage and never change. And he went on to say, a heart, experiences, uh, sorry, a heart experience changes people. And I would agree with that, but I would take it one step forward. I actually think that practicing patterns in our lives and habits is what we see in Scripture and is also something that can beautifully change the way we think and feel over time. You know, the early Christians caught in so many beautiful things like fixed hour prayer and fasting and silence and solitude. These are actually things that we can embed in our lives that can help bring change over time. And we don't have to fear the reality of effort, there's something beautiful that we can lean into. My, my favorite philosopher, his name is Dallas Willard, he put it like this. He said, grace isn't opposed to effort, but to earning. I love that. Effort in our behaviors, in our patterns, is actually a beautiful and wonderful thing. And over time, as our behavior changes, what we notice is our thoughts and our feelings change. For some of us in the, in the room, we feel certain ways about ourselves and about others, and maybe what it takes is leaning in to certain practices that will help change you over time. 
I've been around the church for a while, grew up in the church, and as Pastor Gary said, grew up in a great uh, church family and, and pastor's home. But I have seen that change actually, it's, there's, no, there's no quick fix in the kingdom. It is about practice and formation over time. You with me? Yes. You out there? Okay. So thoughts, feelings, behaviors. One of the things that also can be very help for, helpful for us when we talk about mental and emotional health is the reality of trauma and becoming trauma-informed. And I want to be sensitive this morning because I know there is a large collection of stories in this room of people and all sorts of experiences. But I do think it's important for the church to wrestle through this. You know, one of the things we need to grow in is our understanding of trauma. And as, and as I've grown in this, in my own practice over the last little while, last couple years, um, I've also seen how important it is in our approaches with people within the church community and how important this is. Trauma simply means wound. That's what it means. And there are different types of trauma. There's acute trauma that's from a single event that happens. Some of you have maybe experienced that. Trauma is, can also be chronic in the sense that it's repeated and prolonged. This could be in instances like domestic violence or abuse or continual abuse. And then there's also complex trauma, which is when we're exposed to varied and multiple events, traumatic events, that are often interpersonal in nature. Now, along with lots of research recently about our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, has been a ton of advances the last little while in something called neuroscience. And again, you're not going to flip to scripture in verse for this. You're not, you know, like, hey, the Bible says this about, like, you know, brain science, obviously. But one of the things that we've seen recently is how this, this research can actually affect how we view our brains and what happens in trauma. And I think it's important at least, and I'm going to take two minutes, three minutes, and this is a little out of, so I know there's probably um, uh, registered nurses or uh, doctors here or mental health professionals here. You could probably explain this better than I could. But I do think there's something beautiful in the advances around brain science that can help inform us as we work and learn and, and heal from our own trauma. So I need a little bit of grace. Can you have a little bit of grace for me? I'm actually going to read my notes on this one because I think it's important. But with the brain, there is a front part of our brain called the prefrontal cortex. And this part of the brain is the executive center of our brain. It is where the reasoning happens within our brain. This is where logical reason happens. This is where decision-making is made. It's also where our visual memory is taking consecutive snapshots in consecutive order. And so this is a very important part of our brain because it's where the reason is happening. There's also a middle part of our brain called the amygdala. It's a little almond-shaped part of our brain. And the amygdala remembers every feeling and every single emotion we have ever had, ever in our lives. Science would even say, even in utero, it remembers. And so what we often underestimate is that trauma stays within ourselves. That actually our, our central nervous system is the first thing to grow in utero. And what we've noticed is that traumatic events actually stay in our cells and can be transferred even in utero. Can be transferred in utero. That's why when people ask about the nature-nurture debate, you know, like, is it because of nature and kind of pass from one generation to the next, or is it like a, a more of a nurture environment kind of thing? I always say, yes. The answer to that question is yes. That trauma can actually be passed through the cells, and even when you look at what the scriptures talk about from generation to generation, this can be passed on. So the answer to that is yes. Our environments matter, but also sometimes we have to learn to heal from, uh, from family of origin trauma. So here's the thing. When we are triggered by trauma, one of the things we could all learn is that in that process, our brains are actually protective, but our bodies remember everything. Our, brain, our bodies remember everything. Our brains actually, the prefrontal cortex will often close off to protect us, but our bodies remember everything. So when we've had trauma, like some of us in this room, we've experienced deep, deep wounds, the amygdala, that part in our middle brain, will actually send a message to the prefrontal cortex, the front part, messaging us that the trauma is happening, and we begin 
to think that we are reliving the trauma. So we could be in a, a normal kind of moment and our brain is firing signals like we're, that the trauma is happening and in all reality, if you looked around at the circumstances, it's not. And this is very helpful for us because it helps build empathy, not only for the people around us, for, but for what trauma does, right? Trauma gets stuck in the body. And for some of us, it gets stuck in the place and time and age in which the wound happened. And one of the realities in, in and through this is one of the things we can continue to do is we can continue to understand or heed what our bodies are trying to tell us because they are the things that remember. And that actually when we heed and we pay attention to our bodies, and by the way, Christian theology, brothers and sisters, says that we don't have a body, we are a body, right? So we have a body now, Jesus has a body. At resurrection, we will have a body. Come on, somebody. I'm just, I, I, in my mind, already kind of hoping for like the six pack and like, you know, the, the, the big muscles, but all joking aside, in this moment, with trauma, we have to ask what is going on in our bodies because our bodies are the things that relive this. So what happens is our prefrontal cortex kind of closes off to protect us, and what happens is we often go into survival mode because our bodies are feeling this trauma. For some of us, that's the fight mode where the anger responses come on and activation. For others of us, it's flight, so it's things like anxiety and withdrawing. For others, it's the freeze mode. The key in all of this is to listen to our bodies and go towards our emotions. And so that's why if in working with people, even in private practice, if somebody has had significant wounds, significant trauma, we don't do cognitive therapy. Why? Because the prefrontal cortex is closed off. The front part of the executive center is very much closed off and we have to go to other areas, including the trauma itself. You with me? Yep. You out there? So the same thing happens with anger. My name is Drew Fess, and I have struggled with anger for many, many years. Many years I've struggled with anger. And I would read Jesus' teachings, and I would pray, and I would do all sorts of things to help with that, and that's beautiful. But what I've learned recently is in the same way when our bodies are activated with anger, what happens again is that executive center of the brain closes off, and at times, all reasoning kind of goes out the window. Has this ever happened with you? Amen. Anybody struggle with anger? So you get angry, maybe with a spouse or something, and anger, somebody said, yeah, right. Yeah, welcome <laughs> to my life. Anger happens, and it, it just gets hot, 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 right? And then boom, and then two hours later, you're like, what did we even fight about? Right? That's because what's happening in our brains is reason is literally going out the window because the executive of the center is shutting off to protect us. Uh, I, I don't know if I have permission to say this, but Heather's here somewhere. I'll say it anyways. Uh, the regular guy will be back next week, so it's all good, right? So I guess it's good. But uh, when we were first married, it was like eight months in, we had the mother of all fights. And um, we're just like, Things are getting hot, 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 you know what I'm talking about? And it's not like the good hot, 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 you know what I'm talking about? It's like, and it's just, it's compounding in our prefrontal cortex in technical language are absolutely turned off. And we're saying things and engaging in ways, you know, we're just like talking back and forth and it's getting pretty heated. And I got frustrated and this is back in the day of, back in the day of the Blackberry. So I had my Blackberry in my back pocket and I just in frustration, plopped myself on the bed, and that Blackberry decided to call my intern at the time, and he stayed on the line for 20 minutes, <laughs> listening to this exchange between us. And so he was a little older than me, we worked it out, it was all good, but just like the embarrassment of that moment. But it's an example, right, that even with anger, what we notice is the brain will protect, and sometimes reason goes out the window, and it's all good now, and he, he was fine, but who does that? Are you with me? You, you, would, you would turn the phone off, right? No, you wouldn't. You would, you would totally dial in and listen in. Listen to what Jesus says, Matthew 5, about anger. But I tell you, anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, 
is answerable to the court, and anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Whoa. Now, what I think when we understand how our brains work, even with anger, we, I always say in our house now, and I'm not perfect at this, but in my own growth, less raka moments, right? Less raka moments. There's the, we have the ability with certain practices to have less anger explosive moments. There are actually things that are proven that help bring us and help open up that reasoning part of our brain, including breathing. I thought it was pretty fitting and we didn't even plan this this morning. I love that song. It's your breath in our lungs. And I just think the God-given strategy of being able to breathe to calm or muscle relaxation, sensory scans, listening to our body as part of the process, I think all of these things can help when it comes to anger. At any rate, trauma, when we talk about trauma, the front part of our brain actually opens up when we calm and find ourselves in, in, uh, in calming ourselves so that we can remember and heal. So here's a picture of visual. I promise you we're winding down. Hang with me. This is what we call, sometimes maybe you've seen this in therapy, called the window of tolerance. And in the window of tolerance, that is the space, the window of tolerance there, where it's the optimal zone where we can actually deal with stress and anxiety in our everyday lives, right? This is where there may be stresses or anxiety, but we're actually able to manage them. But what we often notice is it can be very easy to kind of get out of the window of tolerance, and we typically go one of two ways. We move towards hyper arousal, which is like anger responses, maybe activation in our bodies where we become stressed and anxious. Uh, we notice, again, in our body, maybe it's tense chest, heart racing, sweating, whatever it is. Sometimes we go the other way, where we go to more of a hypo-arousal response, which is withdrawing, kind of secluding, feeling numb, moving away, not, not knowing or learning how to feel. And so we can kind of find ourselves in either of those places. Now, what's interesting with trauma is when we've had traumatic experiences, what happens is our window of tolerance gets smaller, and we find ourselves in hypo or hyper arousal more often. But there's hope. The hope is that our win all of us, whether you've experienced trauma or not, our window of tolerance can grow. And there are practices and ways, God, hear me, God-given things, I believe, that can help us expand that window of tolerance and learn how to work with the daily stress and anxiety we feel within the window. Brothers and sisters, I know we don't, this is a first date, I understand that, we don't know each other, but hear me, this is God-given things. This stuff has led me to worship because just like when we break an arm or have issues with our heart, we go to a doctor, there are things that God has put in our hands that can help us. And so we can actually, there's hope because we can treat trauma. Part of that is retelling a traumatic event in calm, empathetic, compassionate, and non-judgmental spaces. This actually helps us increase the ability to manage our intense emotions successfully. It's beautiful, I've seen it even in our own practice. There's actually therapies that can help us move towards our trauma, not to relive these events, but to go towards them to actually help our bodies and our brains heal over time. Do you know this? That you and I can actually desensitize and reprocess our trauma. There's a very popular right now uh, therapy called EMDR. Maybe some of you in this room have experienced this. It's called eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. And just like a broken arm, we can actually go towards certain memories, certain experiences, and we can desensitize to that event or those events over times, and we can reprocess, and brothers and sisters, our brains can actually heal. Amen. Come on. This is beautiful. And so I know, I get it. It's, I live in the tension of like kind of the theology guy, but now this, you know, psychology stuff. I mean, you have to wrestle with this. But one of the things the hope is, is that the church could move towards being trauma-informed in our approaches. And you know what it's done for me is I, I still serve in my church as a teaching pastor and help. Uh, we planted this beautiful little community uh, 10 years ago. 
And it's really helped build em- empathy for me as a leader for my own people. Because it's very easy, is it not, just to push people off, right? Push people to the margins. This helps us understand each other. Brothers and sisters, you and I, were att- we were created, we were designed to be attached to God. The garden, everything is good. They're running around naked. Brokenness, the age, living between the times that we're in right now. But there is this, this hope that we will be reattached. Um, I have a family of four kids. I think we have a picture. And they're wonderful. Don't be deceived by the picture on the right, okay? Because you know how this goes. It looks good, but you know what it took to get there, right? So, um, yeah, so that's my family there. And on the far right, and you can see a picture of him there, that's my uh, oldest son, Judah, who is 12. He's not here with us today, but I um, love Judah so much. When Judah was four years old, he came home to us at the end of a day at the beginning of June and said to us with flyer, with a, like a flyer in hand, Mom, Dad, uh, it's almost the end of the school year, and my class is going to be singing. Are you going to come and hear me sing? And so he passed us this, this uh, invite, and it was to an open house where parents would come, and they would hear their kids sing, and then they would kind of you know, see some of the projects, some of the paintings, different things that were created. And so Judah was super excited about this, and every day he would ask us in the month of June, hey, Mom, hey, Dad, you coming to hear me sing? Judah, we're coming to hear you sing. Next day, hey, Mom, hey, Dad, you coming to hear me sing? We're going to hear you sing. Hey, Mom, hey, Dad, you coming to hear me sing? Judah, we will be there. We would not, I think terms like we would not miss it for the world. We will be there you don't have to worry about this. On the invite, it said 2 o'clock, um, which is kind of near the end of the school day. It would give some time for them to sing, and then would also give some time to see what they had created. And so as a good parent, I thought, you know what we need to do? Let's go for 1.30, right? Because you know, we all know this. Kindergarten parents are crazy. We can just pray and go home on that one, right? You with me? And so we're like, we're going to be there early, 1.30. It'll be good, and we'll make sure that we're kind of in the front row. And so we went for 1.30, and kind of parked the car. And in my mind, as we're parking the car, I'm like, there's a lot of activity for half an hour early. And I got thinking, you know, I wonder what's going on. But I also thought kindergarten parents are crazy. So, you know, probably everybody's doing what we're doing. And so we parked the car, and Heather and I start moving towards the classroom. And I could just feel something in my gut, that something was off. That there was more people in a room that should be, you know? You got that feeling? And I could hear singing. So at first, I, uh, I thought, oh, okay, so maybe because we're really good parents and we're here early, uh, they're practicing, right? Of course. And as we get closer and closer, we realize that there are children singing, and it is to a full room. And we walk in, and we literally walked in right at the end of the third song. Yeah. So we walk in, and Judah immediately runs right into Heather's arms, and he's just crying. Now, what was interesting is that our neighbors had twins in the same class, um, uh, and they were there that day, and they actually took their phone, because they were really good parents, and they videotaped it. What we didn't realize, by the way, is that they had originally sent out that it was at 2 o'clock, but then sent a further notice saying they would moved it to 1 o'clock for more time, and we didn't see that. And so they videotaped the whole, great parents, I know, parent of the year right there. But we watched this video on our TV at night and with our, with our neighbors and just to watch it. Song one is going and we're just zoning in on Judah's face and he's singing and he's kind of looking around and he is just like looking for mom and dad, but in particular mom. We know how this goes, right? Yeah. Just, just looking. Song two starts and the tears just start coming down his face. And he's still singing the song, you know? He's like trying to push through, singing the song. Song three starts, and tears are just, it's just like the floodgates. And you know when you're trying to like sing a song, and you don't even, you're not cognitive of the words, he's just moving his mouth, tears coming down. And then literally we walk in, and he runs right by the camera into his mom's arms. 
And obviously that's a moment that has stood with me for a long time, and we're good now. It's, we're good now. That was a few years ago. But it's a picture for us that follow Jesus that you and I are created to be connected to the living God. We were created for this. We live between the times and brokenness. But brothers and sisters, Paul would use the language, there will be a day when we will be saved. That every experience, every pain, managing the pain, everything that we feel in this moment will be wiped away. This is the hope the Christian tradition. This is the hope we lean into. And even further, brothers and sisters, there is hope here and now that you and I, though there's a lot of disorientation, can be reoriented back to God, connected to him. And as I saw Judah weeping in that video, it just reminds me as humans, but as followers of Jesus, what we're created for. They walked with Yahweh in the cool of the day. Brothers and sisters, you and I will walk with him in the cool of the day in the new earth where he will be at the center. This is where we're headed. And in the meantime, I guess I got in my car and came down the 401 just to remind us there are things that can help us. Certainly prayer, scripture, these behaviors, these patterns, absolutely. But there are things, if you are struggling this morning, that can help us as we endeavor to move forward to that day. You with me? Let me pray for you. King Jesus, I pray that you would, you're here, I know you're here. You're magnificent. And I thank you for this time. I know it's maybe even been a little longer this morning but I just pray that you would seal everything that has happened in this room. God, help us to trust you with our lives, but God, also help us in our own thoughts, in our own understanding, to move towards you and your love, your outstretched arm. I pray for people in this room that feel disconnected and and disattached. May you just come into their lives. Show yourself this morning. And I just pray that, God, in this room, we would be people that would learn over time how to manage the pain until that day, that great and glorious day where you wipe every tear away, you come and you renew all things. We long for that day, King Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Say with me amen this morning. Amen. Amen. Amen.